So good evening and uh, welcome to this session uh, on share pledging and its consequences. Uh, my name is Ramachandran, full name is Kavil Ramachandran. Uh, I'm a professor and executive director uh, of the Thomas Mitani Center for Family Enterprise at the Indian School of Business. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, uh, wonderful session uh, on share pledging. And with me are uh, the uh, co-panelists and the speakers. So let me uh, welcome them. Uh, we will have uh, the uh, two uh, speakers and a moderator for the panel session. So uh, we have uh, Dr. Sachinarayana Chawa. He is the founder, entrepreneur, and the CEO of Laura's Labs in Hyderabad. And he has been uh, one of the greatest uh, successful entrepreneurs, uh, managers, especially during the COVID times. Uh, in fact, some of you may have read that he is uh, considered declared as India's one of the India's best leaders in, in times of crisis in 2021. Uh, so he is also a, a MBA from ISB. Uh, plus, uh, he has a, a PhD from the Andhra University and as well as a, a, an honorary doctorate besides that. He's one of the most recognized and respected uh, uh, entrepreneur, professional uh, and CEO of a, a large company. Uh, so uh, Satin Arena, thank you for joining. Most welcome to the panel session. Thank you so for the introduction. Yeah. Uh, with me is also Professor Prasanna Tantri. Uh, he is one of the foremost uh, leaders of uh, Indian family, uh, Indian business finance system. And he is an associate professor of finance at the Indian School of Business and also the executive director of the Center for Analytical Finance. Uh, Prasanna is a, a MBA from ISB, PhD from ISB, and is my dear colleague. So welcome to this session, uh, Prasanna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Savgata Ray. He is a professor, senior professor of strategy and entrepreneurship and family enterprise at the, uh, at the uh, Thomas Mithani Center for Family Enterprise. And he is one of the foremost leaders of thought leaders in the area of uh, strategy and family business in India. Uh, welcome, Savgata. So we will have a uh, panel discussion led by Sogita Ray, uh, where uh, they will have a combination of a practicing uh, industry leader and a, an academician uh, discussing on the share pledging and its positive and negative implications and how the share pledging can be a, an interesting uh, approach to addressing various uh, uh, growth challenges of a business. And um, we have a uh, working paper, we have uh, prepared a working paper, uh, which is going to be released, we call it as the white paper, which is a, a document which is prepared based on detailed research on the pledging practices, historical practice of pledging in India, what has happened and what is likely to happen, what are the policy implications uh, of share pledging. So this is going to be released after, um, uh, after, after I finish. And um, uh, for this, uh, let me also uh, introduce you Dr. Nupur Paman Bang, uh, who has co-authored this research paper with uh, Professor Saugata Ray. Uh, Nupur is uh, my dear colleague. Uh, she's Associate Director at the Thomas Mithani Center for Family Enterprise. And Nupur is a uh, veteran in the area of finance and uh, also comes from a uh, traditional uh, business family. So we, welcome uh, Nupur. Okay, so let me also take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about what we do at the uh, center. So we, uh, the Thomas Mitani Center for Family Enterprise uh, has its origins in the, from the early days of ISB. ISB was set up in 2001, and we started activities on, uh, in 2003 with a training program. That was because we 
Uh, I have been with ISB since beginning from day one. And in the early days itself, I noticed that uh, nobody was researching, nobody was working, nobody was supporting family enterprises in India, although most of the businesses in India are family controlled. So we started a training program in 2003 with uh, collaboration with uh, Professor John Ward of Kellogg School of Management. So that uh, led to a lot of further activities. By 2007, our uh, credi credibilities and credentials were established. So that is when Dr. Thomas Schmitani from Switzerland came forward and gave us a funding to uh, 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 expand our activities on the family business front. So that is when the Tom, Thomas Schmitani, a chair of family business and wealth management was established. So then onwards, we have been growing. We have been growing as per the, as you can see on the screen, a number of activities started expanding from training to research, to teaching, to media, to a biannual conference called the Asian Invitational Conference on Family Business. So all these things, and we have been expanding exponentially although we have a very small team, uh, we are very ambitious about our activities. We want to create impact um, with the family businesses in the country, transform them, but also we want to make sure that we provide a lot of policy uh, materials, policy inputs for the authorities to address. So it is in this context that uh, uh, this uh, research study has been, uh, has been conducted. So we focus on four areas. One is governance, governance of business, governance on family. Uh, the other is uh, professionalization of family business. Yet another is the strategy and growth of uh, businesses. And finally, philanthropy of family businesses. So these are the four anchors that we focus on. And then uh, we, have, uh, we have been having multiple uh, contributions to the knowledge base. Uh, these are the, this has the list of five major white papers we have published over the years. And you would notice that of late, we have been having a lot of the longitude and analysis of the performance contribution of family business. So one of the major things that we have uh, done is the contribution of family businesses in the economy. So it's in this context that the current study becomes very, very relevant. So let me uh, uh, now uh, invite uh, the panelists, panel speakers, my, our guests to join me in releasing the uh, white paper. So we will have a discussion followed by this. Uh, please, uh, we, have, we have the reports shared with them. So they will be holding the uh, report. And this is the report that we have. Uh, it is uh, shared pledging and its consequences a study of Indian uh, firms. So this is uh, the Thomas Pintani Center's white paper series. It has been authored by the Newport Pawan Bank, who is with us, uh, Saugada Ray, who is also with us, uh, Mr. Nandil Bhatia, who has joined the Columbia University as a PhD scholar recently, and then myself. So I declare the white paper as released. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now uh, hand over the podium to uh, Newport to take the discussion forward. Thank you, Professor Ram. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the release of this white paper today. Uh, as all of you know that Pledging of shares is a very popular phenomenon in India. Uh, every now and then, uh, we read reports of a promoter losing control of the family firm. And uh, many a times, pledging is at the center of these reports. Uh, so the phenomenon is quite popular, yet we see that uh, there are a lot of uh, reports which actually paint pledging with a negative brush. So this piqued our interest at the center that uh, why don't we study this phenomenon because there is an anomaly here. It's popular, yet it is villainized. We also find regulators warning us and cautioning us from time to time regarding the level of pledging in the system. 
in the uh, financial markets. When we started reading about pledging, we realized that, uh, that the literature or the studies done on pledging are very, very uh, few, and uh, especially not in the Indian context. Uh, thus, we decided to uh, thus we decided to work on the um, uh, on, on this topic. And uh, what we found was that uh, there there is the the level of pledging in the Indian system. It's so high that on an average, forty four percent of the uh, shareholding of promoters, those who pledge their shares, forty four percent of it is pledged with the financial institutions. So with this background, we uh, we actually, we will take you through the report. We'll go through the research questions that we have, the data and methods that we use, and uh, the consequences of pledging, which is the core of this paper that we are going to be uh, talking about today, the implications of the study and the conclusions. Now, uh, pledging has been around in India for decades, but it actually came into the limelight during the Satyam scandal when uh, the promoters of Satyam declared to their board that they had pledged almost all the shares in their company. And following that news, of course, there were a lot of other uh, disclosures also that the promoters made to the board. But following this news, the share prices of Satyam uh, crashed and uh, eventually Satyam promoters lost control of their, of their companies. Similarly, there have been many other uh, companies that we know of in the, especially in the recent past, where the promoters have lost control of their companies. Uh, hence, you know, pledging is generally uh, pledging, uh, these stories of pledging come to the limelight uh, during these scandals most of the times. Thus, there is a negative narrative around it. Yet, as you can see in this graph that, uh, almost 26% of all NSE listed companies have pledged some degree of their shares or the other with the financial institutions. And on an average, 44% of their shareholding has been pledged. So it definitely is a very popular phenomenon. So what makes it so popular? If it is such a, such a bad thing, such a negative thing, what makes it so popular? Is it all bad or is there, is some, there is some good in this as well? So uh, this is what we, we try to find. There is contradictory anecdotal evidence, popular yet uh, negative. So uh, we try to find out what are the implications of pledging on different types of firms in India. Is it only popular amongst the family firms or is it also popular amongst non-family firms? What are the consequences of pledging in terms of the value uh, creation uh, measured uh, by Tobin skew or market capitalization. Uh, what is its impact on profitability of the company, the risks and the control. And we measure control in terms of shareholding of the promoters in this paper. Then do uh, heterogeneous family firms face different consequences? Because we know that uh, different types of family firms, especially business groups and standalone family firms have very different characteristics. Standalone family firms are very focused. They, they are uh, mostly one company listed on the exchange, whereas family business group firms are like the Birlas, the Tatas, which have multiple companies listed on the exchange. So uh, do they behave differently? Are the consequences different for them? These are some of the research questions that we try to answer. We use data for all NSE listed firms from the year 2009 to 2019. We have a sample of 1,492 firms for which we have the data available. The pledging data is taken from Prime Infobase, whereas the other financial information about uh, the firms is taken from the CMI Provis database. We match these, uh, the sample of our firms with the family non-family classification done by our center. Uh, so as, as I mentioned that the uh, literature or the studies in this area is quite sparse, but one paper, which is a paper published in the Review of Financial Studies by Dow et al. in 2019, that, uh, that paper looks at the consequences of pledging for, uh, for the management of the company, the insiders, 
but not necessarily the promoters. So we fall, we adopt some of the methods that they look at, uh, that they use for this paper, uh, primarily event study and OLS regression. We use a combination of large sample studies and also a few case studies to, uh, for our study. In our sample, we find that 90% of the companies are family firms and about 10% are non-family. It is pretty representative of, of all listed companies in India, whether we take BSc plus NSC or uh, only NSC, this is quite representative. 57% of the family firms belong to business groups, whereas 43% of the companies are standalone family firms. Now, in terms of shareholder reaction, uh, when we look at the consequences of pledging, we, what we find is that in the short run, uh, using event study in the short run, the family firms have a negative reaction to pledging and the reaction is even more negative when the financial institutions sell the shares if the promoters are not able to meet the margin calls. Whereas there is no counter positive reaction when the promoters release the pledge. That is, they pay back to the financial institutions and uh, get their shares back from them. Then there is no positive reaction. Whereas in non-family firms, the reaction is quite insignificant. However, uh, when, the uh, when the financial institutions sell the shares for the promoters of non-family firms, then we find significant negative reaction. In the long run, all categories of promoters, uh, they, we, we have a negative relationship for all categories of, promotion, uh, of promoters. And we measure the long, long term uh, in terms of province Q. The negative re uh, relationship strengthens when excessive pledge is done by the promoters. And we measure excessive pledge in terms of pledging greater than 75% of shareholding. But even if we take it as 60% or 80%, our results don't change. So excessive pledging results in a greater negative reaction. So on an average, a non-promoter investor views a pledge event as a negative signal as far as large data analysis is concerned. Uh, when, when we look at the uh, consequences in terms of the risk and uh, performance, we find that uh, for both standalone family firms and family business, business group firms, there is higher and significant uh, crash risk. And we measure crash risk in terms of value at risk, shortfall risk, and tail risk. Uh, the details of this is available in our paper and you can also uh, look at the Dow et al paper for uh, uh, how these risks are measured. We also find uh, insignificant relationship with respect to these risks for non-family firms. So clearly the uh, pledging as an event is more important for family firms and the investors are, um, are, are uh, looking at pledging as a negative event more so for the family firms. Now, uh, you know, when, when a firm pledges or when, when promoters pledge the shares, their shares with a financial institution, they are, uh, they try and avoid margin calls. And to avoid margin calls, they may become risk averse or may try and do some sort of earnings management so that they don't send a negative signal to the market and share prices don't go down. So we anticipate that they would become risk averse and they would not want to invest in R&D or in any long-term capital projects or uh, invest in long-term assets. And we do find that family firms actually invest lower in R&D, in CapEx and in assets, and more so in those firms which are affiliated to business groups. Whereas there is an insignificant relationship in non-family firms. This basically, hints towards risk aversion uh, attitude or risk aversion behavior of, uh, of promoters who, uh, who may also be managing the company when they pledge their shares. Now, just, just to see that does this risk aversion behavior, does it actually 
uh, translate into lower performance. So yes, it does translate into lower performance. We find that for those firms which have pledged their shares, the investment in R&D, CapEx and assets is lower and their performance is also lower. Uh, when we look at performance in terms of return in assets, we find a negative relationship between firm performance and pledging amongst family firms and insignificant relationship for non-family firms. Now, a very, very important and very um, interesting graph that we have here is that uh, in, our, in our sample of 1,492 firms, most of the firms have, uh, promoters in most of the firms have shareholding above 50%. So what happens if these promoters, those who have pledged their shares, if these promoters lose that part of their shareholding that they have pledged, what if their share prices go down and the financial institutions are forced to sell these shares in the open market? If the margin calls are not met, what happens then? As you would see in the lower graph, most of the firms will then have less than 50% shares in their firms. In fact, many of the firms will have less than, promoters will have less than 10% or 20% shares in these firms. So the risk of losing majority shareholding is pretty much there when promoters pledge their shares. So if, the, if pledging is so negative, you know, increased risk aversion, increased crash risk, lower performance, uh, stock market reaction is pretty negative, then why do companies pledge? Are there any companies that have used, used pledging successfully? So we dig deeper and try to find out companies which have actually used pledging quite successfully because our past analysis that you've just seen is based on large data analysis. So yes, when we look at uh, 1,492 firms on an average, we find a negative reaction. But when we do a case-based analysis, we find that there are quite a few companies which have used pledging successfully. They have used it for entrepreneurial financing, for starting new ventures. They have also used it for strategic investments by pumping in the money in the same firm. For example, if you look at Asian Paints, the left side uh, graph is Asian Paints. The, their share price, even though they have pledged their shares, you can see that their share price has been doing quite well and they have been able to use the funds from pledging quite well. Similarly, uh, you have Apollo Hospitals that has, that has done a good job of using money from, share, uh, from their pledged shares for expansion and strategic investments. Thus, we find mixed results when we do a case-based analysis on uh, pledging of shares. So uh, the... Uh, some of the implications, um, of course, we'll, we'll, I'll, uh, you know, we make a we make a case that we cannot paint all cases of pledging with a negative brush, and we must uh, look at it even from a case uh, from a case to case basis. But on an average, the results that we have got and the implications of our uh, of our paper for various stakeholders, uh, I would just like to present that. So the for the controlling shareholders, they should definitely be aware of being over, uh, of having over optimistic investment plans um, with respect to pledging and over pledging. The minority shareholders should continue to monitor, minority shareholders and even institutional investors should monitor the quantum of share pledge and also the reasons why the shares were pledged. Because as we saw, the reason why the shares are pledged are, is very important. Is it for financing uh, some other venture? Is it for uh, expansion of the, uh, of the firm whose shares has, have been pledged? Or is it for uh, you know, turning around the company? If the company is in bad shape and they are not able to raise funds through other methods, then are the funds being used for that? The board of directors of the company have to caution controlling shareholders from over pledging because it has a significant impact on shareholder value uh, in the market. And they must shield the firm from suboptimal decision making by owner managers to manage margin costs and share price. That is, uh, caution them from being a, a 
to risk averse and not spending on r and d capex and so on the regulators must take a more balanced and nuanced view of uh, uh, of the policies that they come up with it has pledging has very important corporate governance implications uh, but regulators should also ensure uh, that as much as possible they should prevent rubber stamp votes which will caution the controlling shareholders to some extent and rbi and sebi must talk to each other right now both rbi and sebi uh, make uh, policies which it seems like they are not interacting with each other and they don't have in information about the pledging of companies from each other uh wh what we also see is that many of the families in which the uh, promoter has pledged the uh, pledged shares the other family members may not know anything about the shares being pledged or they may not be aware of the implications of over pledging so there is a need to create awareness and build strong family governance processes that would put checks and balances with regards to excessive pledging in conclusion uh, we can say that pledging is definitely a very very important phenomenon and it must be uh, studied uh, different aspects of pledging must be studied uh, with more uh, nuanced, um, uh, you know, more in-depth and more nuanced, nuanced studies are needed. There is a need for a mix of large data analysis as well as case-based studies. So this is not the first and the last paper from us. This is just the first in a series of papers that uh, we are going to be presenting to you in times to come. Uh, we would also like to uh, make a strong case for discriminating between the end use of funds rather than assuming that all the all pledging is being done uh, for uh, for reasons which are not good for the firm and for assuming that essentially all pledging is bad. With that, I would uh, like to hand over the uh, the stage to Professor Sogata, who would take the uh, discussions forward with our panelists. Thank you, Nupur. Thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. And good evening, everybody. Uh, this is uh, this particular presentation has set the, I will say, platform very well for, uh, I will say, um, thoughtful kind of discussion that we'd like to have from two very distinguished panelists, Dr. Satyanarayan Chaba and uh, Professor Prashanna. Uh, Dr. Chaba is, you know, there is no better person to talk about these issues because he has lived it in a, in a way he has placed the shares and also uh, say what he revoked the pledge at a time when things are going good. So he, he has lived this whole thing and Professor Prashanna has been working or researching on this area for quite some time. So and coming from one somebody from an experiential side, another person from looking at those issues from an uh, researcher point of view and also policy analyst point of view, we'd like to have hopefully a very exciting uh, conversation in the next half an hour or so. Uh, I'll start off with, uh, uh, say, um, Professor uh, Dr. Chaba, that uh, to explain the circumstances under which uh, and the, the motivation behind your decision to place the shares. And of course, in that was this a, as a kind of choice or it was uh, under st distress, become a fait accompli, something like that. And also we'd uh, all like to understand how those funds have been used when you did the pledging. Dr. Chaba. Thank you, Professor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm a scientist turned into a first gener uh, generation entrepreneur. Uh, I don't know much about the finances or the strategy when I started this firm. Only one thing I had in my mind is to grow the firm quicker than the other industries did in pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so we raised uh, uh, capital multiple times from private equities. So by the time we went public in 2016, the all uh, promoter, myself and other promoter designates holds only little over 30%. We were okay um, uh, because I firmly believe 1% of 100 crore 
is same as 100 percent of one crore. So the uh, question is how to grow the pie bigger is the one I always used to think. Unfortunately, um, one year after the IPO, one of the promoter designate wanted to pursue other options. He used to hold five percent. Then our promoter group equity will be significantly less than what we thought it will be. So when he left, I have no option other than to buy the company stock. How to buy company stock? So I pledged my shares, um, raised money, and purchased company stock only. And uh, this was uh, not at a distress. This was an option to increase the promoter's equity within the company. And um, this was discussed within the family, but it was a mixed reaction. It, it was not a unanimous decision, but we, it was a mixed reaction within the family. Yeah. And in a way, the board was um, kind of involved in this decision, or it was purely the decision of you and the family? Uh, it was a decision between me and family. Board was not involved. Uh, when I took a pledge uh, of shares and raised money from the financial institutions, Board was informed at the after the day after the share was pledged and I raised money. Um, oh. so, so, but and anyway, I think it is quite clear that it was more to do with uh, keeping the control of the the farm with you ownership control. That was the the primary reason for the pledge. Okay, and in here, so it is quite from the presentation and also what Dr. Chavez just mentioned that. The share pledging is, a, is, a, is something which is, is a common phenomenon. It's not something which is uh, happens in a blue moon type because shares are a class of financial assets are like any other assets that can be used as a collateral for liquidity. So this was a liquidity that he needed for having his control. So he has exercised this. But there are many entrepreneurs, promoters, family businesses like Dr. Chaba who have been regularly using this option for varieties of reasons for short or medium term financing. Mean, most of the times it is for, for the farm and, and its diversification growth and things like that, sometimes also for personal use. So I'd like to request Professor Prashanna to explain why is then the popular view on pledging by promoters seems to be quite negative because if it is an, another asset class which can be pledged, what is the, why there is a negative view? Is there negative, this negative restriction on pledging? Why is it higher? And what is so distinctive about share pledging then, than the mortgaging the personal assets of promoters? Because it's also a personal asset, it's an asset, but then why, what is the distinction between this? Yeah, first of all, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks, uh, Professor Ram, uh, Professor Sogata, and uh, Dr. Nupur for having me here. Uh, it's, it's nice to learn from practitioners uh, and get another point of view than what we are usually exposed to. Now, let me take this question of whether, uh, you know, I can, I can talk about what the academic research says and also what the popular press says. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, uh, on an average negative reaction, as Nupur uh, pointed out, is sort of justified based on experience. You know, forget Satyam, uh, this whole thing started with, uh, you know, WorldCom and Enron scams. Uh, and even that time, you had this uh, revelation that most of these shares were pledged. Uh, not only that, if you see in the US, starting from 2010, 2012 onwards, the institutional shareholder service, they const constantly tell, in fact, share pledging is the number four negative uh, reason for the advice for non-re-election of a director. So what happens is when they go for a director re-election, and uh, when they, one of the reasons for uh, this uh, negative number fourth most negative reason is uh, share pledging. Now, why is this negative reaction and is it all always justified? So, so there are two reasons, very important reasons that Nupur highlighted, which even the Ron Mosley's, uh, the Dow at all paper talks about. One is the crash risk. There are a lot of investors. Uh, see, in theory, we say that uh, idiosyncratic risk doesn't matter because you're always diversified. If you're like properly theoretically diversified, one company sinking and all doesn't matter to your portfolio. But that's not how real life works. You know, you're not 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 many investors are diversified. Then you're you're exposed to the what happens with the pledge stock is there are circumstances. Let's say if a stock falls twenty percent because of pandemic, nothing to do with companies fundamentals or because of some you know something happening in Afghanistan, something happens and the stock crash. Mechanically, 
these banks have this limit right they have this maintenance margin and moment it for moment your value falls below that let's say you are 100 rupee share and you borrowed 80 you know let's say 50 rupees you know it's usually 50% for some reason you you have touched 60 or whatever is the maintenance margin they have the promoter has two options one is to either bring put in money and make bring it back to that level and unfortunately stock crash happens during the bad during bad times only it doesn't happen during good times where promoter is sitting with tons of money so the question of getting in money is is uh, you know does not does not happen so the only of then what happens is banks start dumping these stocks and unreasonably not justified by fundamentals but that's how they operate so moment you fall below a level these your stocks will be dumped now from a outside investor like you and me we are going to see our stocks fall 80 90% and you know that can you know trigger a chain reaction and there is there is a lot of research which shows that people get extreme disutility from such stocks so if i think that the stock i'm going to own is subject to such kind of a crash risk i may not you know want to touch that stock and that itself will lower explains you know one of the reasons why stocks uh, uh, returns of, to pledging is lower then the re reason nupur already mentioned that you know the promoter himself or herself could become risk averse because now if she she showed that beautiful graph where you know the the if the bank were to dump these stocks the lot of people will lose control and with the fear of losing control uh, see being careful is good but being too risk averse is not good for risk, uh, equity shareholders because by by definition equity shareholders want to grow and they want to take risk but if you give up on positive net present value projects where on an average you're likely to make money with the fear that what if something goes wrong bank will dump my stock and i will lose control that is again not good for the shareholders thirdly why the regulators are negative this is a systemic issue right if a lot of lenders have uh, exposure to this pledge stock this can lead to a contagion in itself imagine if uh, banks start dumping this these stocks so you know the nps are going to raise and that can have a contagious impact so because unfortunately regulators work on an average case and not on a case by case you know they they the regulators are even more risk averse than you know uh, most other people that you see but, and they they the, the best option they see is to sort of you know tighten the screws then you know what i, I agree with nupur that there may be a case to in, in a perfect information scenario where regulator is placed to identify these 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 good people who use this for good purposes uh, but unfortunately that's not the way regulators work they 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 you know they prefer sort of restricting uh, anything that can that can be dangerous so there are many reasons you know i can go on there are there are several more maybe in the next round and i've taken enough time so that's why the perception are, uh, on an average is, is sort of justified so uh, professor professor thank you very much you clarified some of the fundamental issues around this I just want one small thing that uh, i would like you to touch upon that anyway pledging of shares is not a promoter's business alone anybody can pledge shares any individual can pledge shares so what's the finer distinction between in terms of a systemic risk where the promoters uh, pledging risk, uh, shares versus any other shareholders pledging risk fantastic question i think this also i missed your earlier question what's the what's the difference between mortgaging a house uh, and, yes, and exactly. pledging you know i'll take up the second question first so if i suppose i have i am a infosys shareholder i pledge my share it's not going to impact infosys in any way now because i cannot influence decisions of it, uh, infosys and the person who has control over the uh, over, over a company if he or she pledges shares if that changes their their way of thinking see what will happen is uh, nupur talk about 50% uh, control the problem really you know if i if, if you allow me of 30 seconds problem is wedge between control and ownership right so the problem is what what this does when you pledge your share it's like you sold a share and you bought a call option you know those of uh, uh, us who are in the market understand this. so what happens is if it goes down most of these loans are without recourse that means if if the bank cannot go and attach your other property for this loan so once i got rid of let's say i'm going to have a negative information i know that my company is not going to do well so one way is to dump this sell the shares but that will directly give a negative signal rather i can pledge my shares uh, to a bank and then suppose if that negative event does not happen upside is mine because i still hold the control of the company you know the stock goes up the upside is mine the downside is banks and somebody else so this is the kind of incentive that uh, misalignment that pledging creates for uh, 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 when when the person who pledges is a controlling shareholder but if it is like somebody like me random shareholder two shares there is no question of firm 
you know strictly speaking pledging should have no impact on the firm because it's my business you know i have the share and i go and pledge as long as it does not uh, distort the incentives of those who control the firm so unfortunately in case of promoters it, it there is reason to believe that it's going to distort their incentives their their decision making in in most cases of course there are exceptions that that nupur pointed out so that is why people tend to view this neg negatively and same answer goes for mortgages you know you sell your house yeah indirectly it can impact you know you you may be under pressure and it may impact your work but not as much as pledging the share uh, share itself there the so the the answer to your second question it's a degree in in terms of uh, it's it's a difference in kind the the second question it's a magnitude you know the if i pledge something else versus share the magnitude of impact may be different so that's why uh, you know it, it does matter thank you thank you i think you brought that very well i think one is thing is very clear right, for the audience is that the pledging of shares by non promoters in any firms are, are not really going to make any consequential difference to the fate or, or the value of the firm and that's the primary difference whereas as professor prashant has nicely explained that, that the chain of events that may happen if a promoter pledges his shares and some uh, the unintended kind of reaction that comes from the the banks in terms of uh, diluting or other um, say going for a margin call and things like that so um, but and therefore it is quite understandable that this may not be fair from all promoters because the variations are significant that there are some promoters who might be pledging the stocks for for the good reason the, in fact the farms have a possible benefit from share pledging because those monies can be in this money can be invested in the growth projects etc but then uneasy lies the head that wears the crown so <laughs> unfortunately it will be always been perceived uh, negatively and there is no um, and, uh, no easy way out of it so uh, and and promoters have to accept this burden of responsibility so there perhaps at some stage we'll discuss that uh, from the panelists that uh, there there may be more information on the market proactively perhaps would be kind of taking care of some of those um, say negative perception from specific promoters so we also see that there are wide variations as nupur has uh, presented in terms of how the 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 share pledging um, say proceed of that is being used some promoters do the share pledging very uh, judiciously thoughtfully sparingly and revoke the pledge at an opportune moment and like dr chaba who had actually done that and i would like to let's say listen from him that uh, why did he basically uh, picked up rather um, did that make that decision to revoke the pledge uh, at a certain point in time what might be the trigger what might be the motivation and how and again the same thing was it is his personal decision the family decision or others played a role in influencing that decision uh, dr chaba uh, thanks professor so um, for uh, for us uh, this is the only business we are in so for us to clear the pledge revoke the pledge we need to sell the shares the question is when to sell the shares uh, if we are greedy and very selfish um, and uh, people do wait for a very opportunistic moment when the share price is at peak but uh, we decided to sell uh, at a date why we decided to sell at a date is if we don't sell at the date we need to um, take money from another institution and to pay to one institution we don't want to do that as i said we are not selling all our shares we are selling less than 5% of our uh, share holding so we decide to sell uh, during the q4 of fa21 so that decision was made uh, much earlier to the sale uh, uh, of the shares it was a, a combined family decision and everybody appreciated and we also informed the board and uh, like you mentioned this is the asset what we have so uh, we never felt bad to uh, pledge the assets and take money uh, for uh, gaining little bit more uh, equity share in the company and uh, when we did this uh, today uh, share price appreciated 70% more than uh, what i sold in the last 6 months but i was very happy 
because see, I my 96% of shares also appreciated. I'm not worried about 4% what I sold. So uh, I was very happy for the decision because there was a little overhang in the uh, this so-called social media savvy uh, people. They don't uh, read two lines. They won't read the first line. Shares are pledged. Shares are pledged for what purpose? And what is the uh, proceeds uh, where those uh, uh, money was used? Nobody has the patience uh, in this uh, uh, speedy world to read uh, what is in uh, below the line. So we want to get rid of that hang um, uh, on the company and personally. So we decide to sell and it was a uh, decision which was appreciated by all family members, uh, board also very much appreciated. And I also felt very happy once the shares are uh, uh, pledge was uh, revoked. And uh, it was a good decision, I feel. Uh, I, I never felt a second that uh, I sold at a lower price. I, I said my share price is going up and I still own a uh, uh, significant portion of the shares. But Dr. Chaba, I think, see, on a reflection, I would like to put it on, on um, to you is basically one that you have a temptation, rather is an opportunity to, as you said, that to actually go to another institution, take money and do that other than diluting your share. You could have played around with the pledge, uh, changing hand. That is one option. And it's not that some people don't do that, but you deliberately chose not to do it. And that it reflects certain values in And does that perhaps has any relation, say significant impact on the on the market as such that they looked at your pers- your image as an as a scrupulous uh, kind of uh, promoter and the leader that gone up because of not taking that other route probably yes uh, professor so the reason uh, see as nupur also mentioned there is a little bit of uh, uh, governance issues also will be there because uh, as a leading uh, uh, members of the organization, governance uh, should never be compromised. Uh, And share price goes down, goes up. uh, And uh, your data also clearly mentions the people who pledge their shares, they don't invest in the long-term growth. They are worried about uh, quarter by quarter profitability to keep the share prices high. Uh, But when I purchased the shares, uh, our share uh, price went down by 30%. Um, went down by 30 percent. So I have to pledge more shares to uh, as a margin, as Professor Prasanna also mentioned. Uh, but uh, we uh, never felt uh, a, a movement also bad about uh, releasing the uh, pledge. And uh, we both appreciated. And um, uh, uh, I heard of doubt on the investor's mind uh, that we don't think short term, these companies now can definitely be considered. These guys will look at long term prospects of the organization because they have no vested interest to uh, that. That's the opinion I have. Yeah, I think this is because this is an excellent example of uh, in a difficult you know, decision that how values can play a very significant role and how actually that kind of can have a positive impact even in the uh, market. So, but one thing that um, quite appears from the Nupur's presentation and also the way Professor Prashan explained that while uh, pledging is a common phenomena, but there are a kind of several uh, norms has been uh, introduced by SAB, RBI, et cetera, with the perception that pledging is not uh, very good. There are um, say um, more negative things about pledging than the positives or stories like what Dr. Chaba is uh, sharing with us. So, um, therefore, the question that I'd like to ask both uh, Dr. Chaba and also um, uh, Professor Prashanna, that uh, basically, what are the, say, how um, this pledging can be uh, made a little more popular, or in a sense that the negative perception around pledging, how that can be uh, Warded off. Or before doing that, I will ask another question before that is related to that where can pledging go wrong? Because Dr. Chaba has given an example. Professor Prashanna also mentioned something earlier. Nupur in his presentation has, has actually explained some of the situations. But where do the can pledging can really go wrong and severely wrong 
that this kind of risk perception that is there in the market and more importantly from the regulator's point of view they become extremely careful about it because as professor prashan has explained earlier very well that regulators cannot operate on individual cases regulators have to kind of take an average view of things so what are the some of those possibilities where pledging can really go wrong so i'll request dr chaba and professor prashanna to to give a few possibilities of that kind um professor said pledging can go wrong if people do pledge so more than 50% of their holding and uh, they use these proceeds in a unrelated areas where the governance issues will come and uh, the gestation period of unrelated businesses may drag and also the promoters interest to run which uh, type of businesses when they are too much diversification so a lot of questions can happen and uh, when people do have multiple businesses uh, it depends on which one they are having passion i will take their line share of their mind so there are a lot of challenges so i personally feel the regulators also should uh, limit the percentage of shared pledge and also there should be a clear indication what are the uses of these proceeds when listed companies do uh, shared pledge wonderful thank you yeah uh, so i have i've already discussed several such instances so i'm more interested in the second the, in fact the first question that you asked what can we do but quickly yeah. let me uh, respond to that where can it go wrong uh, on on things other than what has been discussed so far there is this phenomenon called tunneling right which academic uh, literature keeps talking about so what happens there is again i i just started with that wedge right think of a firm where you have only 20% cash flow rights that means you you've invested only 20% but effectively you are the controlling uh, owner you know because uh, because of the way the shares are uh, spread over individual investors and or or you control several entities which are shareholders of the same firm you know there are so many ways you can actually effectively control a firm with just 20% stake you don't need 50% stake to control a firm you know you can create pyramidal structures where you have a form you have another form you know so you can have 10 pyramids so the the real owner can have just 20% now the problem let's say you have another form where you have 100% cash flow rights it's all your money now just imagine you know i'm just wearing my professor hat that you steal 1 rupee from that form where you have uh, literally you know just imagine literally you take steal 1 rupee and pick that from that form and give it to this form what are you doing you are losing 20 paise from the from the form from which you are stolen and you are getting 100 you know 1 rupee to the form which which you are given because here it's 100% your money there it's only 20% and in both cases you are controlling that's the wedge i am talking about in both the cases you are the controlling owner and you can control decisions now what we find in in one of the negatives is that usually that the the promoters target companies where they have a large wedge to pledge it is usually again i am there are honorable exceptions like dr chawa it's see ideally if it is need based and all it should not depend on the wedge that you have so the 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 target company who shares are pledged are those where the promoter has lower cash flow rights and higher control rights and the beneficiary of this uh, money the when they when they borrow this money and then the invest they, either it's personal or it is those companies where they have higher cash flow rights so now the problem is cost will be borne by this company where there are large number of minority shareholders who have no control on this where the benefits if at all will go to the other company so that's the kind of uh, uh, you know things that people are up to and unfortunately from a regulator point of view you know they are also uh, not super you know they are two steps behind uh, the 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 industry and uh, you know I, i'll tell you the problem with with this pledging is what can be done i think the answer is as as nupur said if investors can know with with credibly know the purpose you know the credibly is important you know there there can always be a cheap talk right i can always say that this is for investment and you know this there is that, that credible part is missing 
So one way that credibility can can come from is is through track record. Like if tomorrow if Dr. Chawa says, I'm sure markets if he if he pledges for a new investments, I don't think market will go down. Uh, but then that has to be built. Unfortunately, people have even the promoters have not covered themselves with glory. Uh, they have resisted all attempts of regulators to uh, you know uh, uh, for for increasing disclosures. Uh, even after Satyam, they have discovered new ways of not disclosing. Again, every time regulator had to find out that now you are doing this, you are calling it NDU, but it's not NDU. It's actually pledging. You know, so every time there has been a resistance, unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, to to even disclose. You know, I I totally buy Nupur point Nupur's point that if uh, if uh, you know if purpose is known, many reactions may 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 not be negative. But if if I know that this person is trying to hide something, is unwilling to disclose. Whatever you know, then it is reasonable for the market or regulator to average uh, to assume that there's something wrong because afterwards you know that's that's how we operate. So that's the problem. I think the onus is also on the industry to first build credibility and also disclose well. Why not write more than what the regulator wants? You know, explain in your annual report. This is an opportunity. Banks are not funding. There is this great opportunity. That's why I'm investing. In fact, there's a nice paper by Praveen Singh who shows that when you pledge your shares for lo loans for the company, not for your personal purpose. Stock stock market reaction is not negative. It's not that everybody reacts negatively. Stocks actually react. You know, reaction he finds positive reaction. It's only when you when you are opaque and when you when you when you have when you don't have a good track record. That's and unfortunately that's the average case. Uh, that's where both regulators and investors tend to be sort of view uh, people negatively. I think uh, onus is also on the industry and the promoters to you know establish credibility here. So I further push the needle on this one. Two things that you said, Professor Prashant. Now, one is uh, based on um, your explanation, it appears that the companies or the, the family business groups following pyramidal structure, in such situation, the pledging can uh, be misused or abused more than the case where the, in the individual uh, businesses are run by individual fam uh, family businesses or any other promoters. So standalone businesses are likely to have a better issue. But then what we find in our research that market really doesn't discriminate between the two. So there must be some issues of market information asymmetry or market imperfection that might be playing a role. But this is an interesting, um, say, segue or, uh, or a kind of variation that we have to see that why that is not happening as such because uh, and, and 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 this what you explain is quite um, a, a well researched phenomena but somehow i think we don't see the same thing happening in india in terms of as far as the empirical evidences are concerned that's one the other thing that you said where i would like to uh, basically um, uh, take a little different view that when you said that uh, the pledging is done and as a result, the minority shareholders and other non-promoter shareholders, they pay a price for the, the something goes wrong for the pledging. But then, and for that, we castigate the, the, um, the promoters. But it, sometimes it happens other way around as well, that by doing this pledging, whether it is a pyramidal structure or um, say a family business group on or standalone family firms or promoter driven firms that even in spite of their having a say minority share or maybe 30 percent share 40 percent share by pledging they put the money in the farm and the entire shareholders gain out of it so many a times the other things also happen that the minority shareholders without taking any risk proportion disproportionately gain because the the, the um, promoter had pledged their share and helped the farm at a distress. So how do you reconcile that? And why it is that only the, uh, the, the promoters will have to pay, pay the price all the time? No, I, I don't think there is anything to reconcile. In fact, I, exactly that's what I said. Pravin Singh's paper exactly shows that. In fact, when you're when you're pledging for the sake of the firm, when you invest, when you're transparent, stock prices gain. You know there is no re reconciliation. We are saying talking about the same thing. The problem is when you're opaque, when you're not telling why you're pledging, and when you're resisting all kinds of uh, you know transparency moves. That's where people uh, tend to get scared. And secondly, the issue about what you find, you know, I've looked at the paper carefully. I'm talking about the wedge. I'm not talking about the stake. You know, the wherever there is wedge, I don't think you looked at that. 
you know the the issue is with wedge the, the mm. tunneling is not dependent on stake when you have lower stake and higher control that's where the problem is yes so those are the people who are you know where because you don't you effectively don't own 50% of the firm you're owning a quite less but you're controlling the firm through pyramidal structure so your people doesn't look at that aspect you know i didn't see that at least whatever yeah. i have so there is no difference in what i'm saying and what you are saying i agree with your findings on an average so the issue is with again you said what is the issue with minority shareholder the problem with minority shareholders is i can't take my tomorrow if you are to invest will you invest on an average when you don't have information on an average case or a exceptional case you know you should have information for that exception dr chawa is an exception that's why we are calling him right otherwise if if everybody who had pledged had uh, done this so i don't think there was any need for this discussion the sad part is it's an exception and how does a minority shareholder know ex ante that this dr chawa is a noble person that's a whole problem you know i can't after the fact see i'll show you 50 people who have reached bangalore dri driving 300 kilometers and survived and may i don't know whether it is a skill or uh, they were they were lucky i need to know the denominator the unfortunately if i take the denominator exactly what you find you know the de denominator once i take into account the average case is bad and uh, that's how we operate you know that's sad but what to do we need to have that's why i said if industry can credibly signal that this pledging is not for and that province is that there is so it's again i disagree with lot of things i don't think academic research have all pointed out a negative sign i pointing out indian paper pravin singh i am ahmedabad very finds it positive there is a paper on china which finds no negative reactions of pledging and you know there are instances that that's true but if if there is no information if 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 people don't know to discriminate ex ante it's given the evidence it's reasonable reasonable to assume it as a negative signal you know i can't find dr chawa ex ante after the fact what do i do you know how do i knew how do i know four years ago that Uh, you know uh, this is going to turn out positive that's a big question you know you can always pick cases which have succeeded afterwards and say look this is great but how do i know ex ante yeah so absolutely fair point because the policies and the regulations cannot be made based on of outliers it has to be based on the the the, the averages but the point i just wanted to check with dr chaba that how the outliers kind of um, say play a role in terms of improving the averages is there any way um, it is possible that this kind of outliers who are positive outliers will kind of uh, help to improve the averages uh it is kind of a legal and police system see police wanted to catch 10 to find the culprit but legal is different they take a different view so there is also uh, i would uh, view so we give a lot of importance importance to the outliers whether it is successful or a failure and those shouldn't drive the rest of the majority so we give importance to the minority uh, 1 2% outliers and then punish the re real 98% uh, who can benefit out of uh, uh, good rules i'm not saying there, there are difference between good rules and stringent rules stringent rule means they they want to put uh, regulations where no um, uh, bad thing happen but if rules are so stringent no good things also happen bad things doesn't happen good things also doesn't happen so it, there should be a lot of flexibility and uh, some kind of a balance when these uh, guidelines or rules are put in place yeah so i think the the the, the key word is that balance and this is what we are actually in the in the search for that what will be the right balance because when we looked at the you know, the evidences and particularly when you looked at the case studies it appears that for, from the promoters and entrepreneurs point of view that the regulations are uh, quite restrictive uh, even for good promoters etc but again if you look at from the uh, from a policy perspective perhaps there are still spaces where things have to be tightened as uh, professor prashant was mentioning that there perhaps need for even forcing the promoters to come up with and give those intentions behind it credibly so is there any mechanism by which actually uh, more information can be put in the market something can be voluntary but it's it, if it is involuntary if it is kind of say put it into the framework of regulation it becomes easier so professor prashanna if you any specific suggestion that you can make that which actually um, help or rather the promoters to 
to say put information in the domain in what way they should put those information that will help them to actually ward off this negative perception uh, let me uh, i think uh, i mean slightly i i was not clear on what i you know what my recommendation was i am not a person who favors any kind of you know any more regulation on this uh, you know i think it's not about regulation i all that i said is i i am you know i am not asking for regulators to make promoters do x v or x y or z you know regulators have done enough it is in the interest of the promoters to credibly signal to the market that their intentions are good so there are many ways of doing it you know the, it could be as simple as disclosures in annual reports uh, you know or or disclosing past history disclosing the project see why why are you pledging you know one case uh, dr chawa mentioned there could be the way i see the big positive for me you know unfortunately we never got chance to discuss the positives of pledging uh, because uh, we only discussed about negative <laughs> yes, exactly. so your your paper talks about the paper that uh, nupur sent me talks about that yes. that there are there are market failures you know there are credit rationing everybody knows you know there are positive npv projects where somebody insider like dr chawa knows that this is going to succeed on an average without taking Uh, too much risk, but the uh, the the outside uh, investor or outside lender cannot see that. And the problem it's not it cannot see. It's it, there is no credible way of seeing it because they don't understand this business. So that is where the 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 role of communication comes in. It it's the it's the way that you explain to your investors. It is it is you point out projects, give details. Why are you pledging? What is the kind of project that you are going to invest on? Or what is the short term issue that that is forcing you to pledge? And why is it short term? and and if you have a history and what about history and give all this i think that that's going to take 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 this perception and i don't want regulators to either liberalize or string, make make it more stringent you know as long as they are asking for disclosure what is the problem you know they are not banning pledging you know and i uh, the regulation of rbi limiting banks exposure is also valid you know you can't expose the 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 people don't understand you can't look at as a regulator you cannot look only from your own favorite uh, point of view you know we have to look at the system also if banks are neck deep into some large firms uh, there can be systemic crisis will impact the whole economy and way beyond this financing issues so i think regulators are are, are fine i am not asking for regulators to do anything more maybe there is scope to uh, increase those limits and liberalize regulation and not make it stringent but my point is repeatedly promoters have not covered themselves with glory on this they have repeatedly tried to hide you look at the disclosures you know why did they come out with things like ndu when when after satyam all that regulator asks is disclose in 14 days what is your problem instead of disclosing they created a opaque structure called ndu where instead of pledging you create a third party just you know in 30 seconds if you give me all that happened was instead of giving it to a bank i'll give it a, put it in an escrow account and because i put it in an escrow account i'll call it's not pledging i don't have to disclose now as an investor if i see then why do you, why don't you want to disclose that you pledged your shares that means there's something not so nice about it right so that this kind of attitude as long as it prevails be it tax Uh, be it ratio of tax, be it uh, uh, loans, be it pledging, uh, this is not going to get solved. Negative perception will justifiably remain, and and I think it's, it's you're doing a great job by highlighting these successful cases. But trust me, there will be outlier successful cases even when something is bad. That's how distribution works. You know, on an I can show you somebody who drew, had liquor for eight years and is healthy and all good. So that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, it's a great thing that the the thing is. on an average industry has to sit together and 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 figure this out how do they communicate i don't think regulators can do much about it rather than i am I'm, i'm not for one i am not advocating anything more uh, regulation or banning pledging or you know it's 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 a valid instrument as long as there are market failures exist you know if, and people like dr chawa or good let them use it and uh, flourish why not yeah but i think uh, you have already pointed that out that through this uh examples that where pledging has been used effectively and how they can communicate it better because if the intention is noble and if that intention is right and if it is communicated earlier uh, that would be i think would at least solve some of the problems that we are uh, witnessing so i think we have already taken uh, most of the time so i have just have to to wrap this up and thank you very much Dr. Chaba and uh, Professor Prashanna for sparing your evening for this webinar and sharing these wonderful insights. I think we got a very good holistic understanding of issues around pledging, both positive, negative, and uh, and there are 
um, say something to look forward to in terms of in the future in terms of fine tuning the research we are also grateful to nupur uh, for a very insightful presentation and also uh, uh, say nandil who is actually attending the webinar i just saw that he is in the presenting the webinar he is he has contributed immensely into these studies and several other studies which are as nupur was mentioning will be coming uh, soon and he is doing his phd in columbia university uh, for, for his contribution and we are grateful also gratitude to sushma for quietly taking care of all the logistics for the webinar and of course professor ramachandran for constantly encouraging and leading us through this journey uh, thank you very much and last but not the least i would like to thank everyone who joined the webinar to make it a success uh, that's all from thomas midani center and isb uh, have a very nice evening thank you all thank you thank you thank you thank you bye thank you everyone